afternoon session for the World Conference. Uh, our next presentation is on performance graphing and trending best practices. Our presenter is Matt Wall, and he is a mechanical engineer out of Boston, and he has been uh, hacking away at Nagios Graph for about the last two years. So let's give Matt Wall a hand. Still, st there we go. All right. Um, as Mike said, um, my name is Matthew Wall. Uh, here from Boston. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to go over, then give you some background on before I dive into things. Um, I'm going to talk about why graphing and trending is an issue. Um, talk a little bit more after that about what a, a nice trending system really should do. Then go into some of the parts of that, what that means with respect to Nagios in particular. We're going to go over some of the options that are out there right now that you can actually play with and install on your own systems and then go over some of the best practices. What are the issues that are involved? What are some things you can do up front to save yourself some pain later on? So for context on this, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I, I design aircraft engines in my, as my day job, basically. Um, I use evolutionary algorithms to solve some pretty nasty engineering problems. Um, but in doing that, we deal with a lot of computer systems. We have massively parallel algorithms that go out to tons of different machines and go chewing away on things. So we have to monitor those machines. And uh, I do this at some large companies monitoring hundreds of computers. I also do this at some other installations. There's a, um, an aircraft manufacturer in the Boston area that I do some consulting for. They um, have a few servers in a closet bunch of workstations their engineers use. Um, also done some work with my brother, keeping some databases online for a certain BS pop star to do the ticketing systems for her concerts and so forth. Um, I also do uh, some monitoring of some real systems on an island off the coast of Maine. It's actually a lighthouse, and I'd be happy to talk about that with some people, about water levels, pressure levels, solar system, heating water, um, septic system, and all that kind of thing. So when I get in, my background on all this Nagio stuff is kind of the low end. It's, uh, we do a lot of the hacking ourselves. We often have people with expert skills setting the things up, but then have to turn that over to people who have no idea what's going on. They just need to see the blinking lights and maybe the pictures to tell them what's going on. Um, basically, we have no budget for any of these things. So everything we do on a shoestring, whatever we can pull together, um, that doesn't sound common, does it? Um, and there's a pretty high hack factor on getting things set up for us. Um, it's okay if things don't work right out of the box. We've got people around who can get it to work and go on from there. So that's the context for this. So right up front, I'm going to tell you some of the options I'll be talking about. I'm going to come back to this later on. The four on the left are integrated within Nagios itself. The the two on the right, you can do some integration, but they're more standalone tools. I'm going to be dealing more with the types of tools that you see on the left side of this rather than the ones on the right. But we'll touch on all these so you have a, a feeling for what you can do. So why is this a problem? Why is graphing and trending an issue? Nagios does a great job of indicating current status. It tells you what's going on right now, what's up, what's down. But when you look at the trending built into at least Nagios core, trending consists of well, this is when we had failures, and this is when we didn't. It doesn't tell you anything about the performance data from those things. It just tells you what's up and what's down. Now, that's different from Nagios XI. It's got some graphing. It's got PMP for Nagios built into it. Um, but Nagios core trending doesn't tell you anything about performance data. How hot did things get? How, um, what were the actual levels involved? It's just an on-off kind of thing. What were the warning critical the states? So. This is actually a problem because, like, if you're just going into a new environment and setting things up, you've got to figure out what notifications actually matter and which ones don't. And um, it's also helpful to know what's happening in between the notifications. You know, what happens when you close the refrigerator door? Did the light really go off? What's going on below your thresholds? Um, it, for going back in time and looking at what caused the disasters, it's very useful. Are there correlations between different things? Did a bunch of things go off at the same time? And it's, that information then is in turn useful for predicting 
future disasters and fending them off before they happen. So I'll give you a couple examples here to show what I mean. Um, one of them has to do with temperature monitoring. This is really what got me onto Nagios in the first place. With all the systems that I've been monitoring, whether it's for clients or at some of the larger companies I work with, uh, power has always been an issue. And we've got everything on ups because we can't data, our data is really important. So we've got everything on ups to try to recover and make it through dirty power and all that kind of thing. But uh, I've had batteries burst into flames because either the battery was going bad or the controller was going bad or we've had really dirty power and so the voltages were just way too high for the power supply, things like that. So I've actually had things catching on fire. And after that burning up some computer systems, we decided it's time to put some monitoring on there so that we can catch this stuff before it comes a, becomes a problem. So from my point of view, all the network monitoring and that kind of stuff, that's nice, but it's been the physical systems that have been more important and m driving me more in this. So I'll show you a couple examples here. Uh, this is at that aircraft manufacturer in the Boston area. Um, they've got a small server closet, not too many machines in there. I don't know, maybe 10 or something like that, some racks, some Dell 2900 series stuff. But it gets warm. There's air conditioning in there to try to balance it out. But we got this, uh, this right here. There was a, a warning that went off there. And that kind of tipped us off to something's going on there. We looked back at these graphs and we saw these spikes. Well, not spikes, these are actually, they're actually an exponential curve and thermal warming curves. So one day, every day, get these pumps on weekdays. And then on the weekends, there's nothing. It's nice and flat. And then the next week, it starts up again. And if you look, so these plots are from three different UPSs attached to three different machines in that server closet. The first two are actually well below the thresholds. The bottom one's up a bit higher. So we wouldn't even have caught this had the not other one been running warm. Turns out that there's an engineer that sits near that closet. When he would come to work in the morning, every day the first thing he would do would be to close his door. Well, it turns out that the air conditioning sucks a lot of air through his door <laughs> in order to get into the server room. And <laughs> that was block constricting the airflow enough to, drop, to let the temperatures go up in that server room. So how, <laughs> how would you ever figure that out? So, they did some duct work, now they've got nice ventilation, no problem with these temperatures going up. It's nice and flat all the time now. But we never, I mean, that, that one alarm going off, we would have no idea what was going on with that if we hadn't, didn't have this trend data to give us, let us see a pattern here and then make the correlation, oh, it's on weekdays and Bill, who's sitting next to the room, comes in at those times, that's what it is. Another one, they, they monitor software licensing there using Nagios. Um, so they've always wanted, to know, well, how often are our own people using the licenses for the software that we've got? Do we have too many licenses? Can we get away with paying for half as many licenses? This is, in, is for SolidWorks. It's a solid modeling software and some of the related add-ons to that, which are some finite element codes and such. So using Nagios on this, we can actually see what the profiles are. And here, once again, you can see the daily spikes. It's really fuzzy. Um, you can see the daily spikes when people come into the office and start using the software. And you can see um, in two cases, the first and third case, they're not even close to the license limits. They could actually cut in half the number of software licenses they've got and still be fine. Whereas with the second one, they're closer to the license limits there. So knowing what's going on under your thresholds really matters. It helps you make decisions. And knowing how those thresholds change in time matters too. Here's another example from, this is just a disk off of a, a video server in one of these installations, that we started out with thresholds that are right up the top, near the, the top of the disk capacity. Then at one point in time, those thresholds were dropped a bit just to give us a more comfort zone. The f at first, when they were going off, it was like the disk is full and that's it. We had no buffer in which to deal with the issues. But the important point of this is, especially when you are dealing with management teams or making decisions, it's not good enough just to know what your data are. You need to know how and how those data change in time. You also need to know how your requirements change in time. If your thresholds have changed from the last time you did your measurements, you need to know that because that affects the decisions you make later on. So keep track of your thresholds, not just your data. And another example, more dynamic environments. This is a, a set of network uh, throughput. This is a network throughput graph for a data zero. So that was the, basically a file server on this network. This is another client that has, they do a lot of distributed continuous build systems using Hudson. They've got about between 30 and 50 virtual machines that fire.